First, some housekeeping details. On the webinar website, you should be able to find some useful background materials that have been supplied by our panelists, as well as the PowerPoint presentation. And uh, after each segment of today's presentation, and again at the conclusion of the panel, there will be an opportunity for the audience members to post questions to our panelists directly using the chat box interface on the website. And with that, I'd, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to today's panelists. Uh, we have Sean Egan, the president and a founding principal of Egan Jones Ratings Company, uh, which was founded in 1994. Egan Jones has been a nationally recognized statistical rating organization since 2008. We also have Lisa Lindsley, who is the Director of Capital Strategies for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, which is the largest public employee and healthcare workers union in the United States. We also welcome Jeff Mahoney, the General Counsel, of the, uh, General Counsel for the Council of Institutional Investors, a nonprofit association of public, union, and corporate employee benefit funds and foundations and endowments with combined assets that exceed $3 trillion. CII has long been a leading voice for good corporate governance and for share owner rights in America. We're also pleased to welcome Barbara Roper, uh, the Director of Investor Protection for the Consumer Federation of America, uh, an association of nonprofit consumer organizations established in 1968 to advance consumer interests through research, advocacy, and education. Barbara played a major role in advancing some of the central ideas in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. I am a partner with Lauditon Suchero, and I represent institutional investors in corporate shareholder litigation, as well as in corporate governance matters. Now, the real focus of our panel today is sort of the state of play for efforts to reform the credit rating industry. But to understand whether these efforts are likely to succeed, we have to start with exactly what went so disastrously wrong in the years leading up to the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. And I think one of the recurring themes uh, in the documents released by investment bankers in the wake of the crisis is that even the bankers themselves saw their clients as dupes. In the New York Times last week was the story of a sales representative from one of the major investment banks who in early 2007 had miraculously found a buyer for a particularly dubious mortgage-backed CDO. The Times reported that the salesman wrote in an email that, quote, I think I found a white elephant, a flying pig, and a unicorn all at once. But I don't think in the end it was that investors got taken in simply because they were gullible. An important part of the problem was that the extremely risky instruments that they were buying uh, had been given sterling ratings, and investors were relying on those ratings in assessing risk. In fact, U.S. regulators had in many ways mandated investor reliance on those flawed ratings. and so. In our presentation today, we're going to try to explore what went so awry in the ratings industry and the extent to which recent reform efforts have addressed these problems. I think we're going to be starting uh, by hearing from Sean Egan of Egan Jones, um, although actually I think we're going to switch to Sean a little bit later in today's presentation. We'll go directly to Lisa Lindsley from the AFSCME. Lisa, are you on? Yes. Terrific. Why don't, why don't we go to uh, your presentation, Lisa? Great. Well, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. I'm going to talk about um, the role of the credit rating agencies in the financial crisis. And I don't see my slides up yet. Great. Thank you. So the, the debt in the U.S. Uh, financial markets tripled during the 1980s. And at the end of the 80s, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, at the end of the 80s in 1990, um, debt in the market was $13.8 trillion, and 11% of that was mortgage-related. Uh, but then during the period leading up to the financial crisis, um, mortgage securities uh, became the single largest component of the debt market in the United States. They were 18%. So they were – actually, can you go back one, please? Thanks. So they were uh, 
18% of the market, and they were lar a larger component of the debt market than even U.S. Treasury securities. Um, so you can see there that uh, securitization was, was driving uh, the subprime loans that were, that were being made. And uh, next slide, please. Without the rating agencies, uh, the securitization couldn't have happened. Um, what happened is that um, the subprime loans were not agency papers. They were they were loans that um, investors were not accustomed to buying, risks that, that they were not accustomed to buying. And this created a business opportunity for the credit rating agency <clears throat> because they were uh, able, they were supposedly able to evaluate the, the risk. And the way securitization works is that uh, the, the supposed uh, benefits of securitization include pooling and diversification. And then the, um, as you can see from this graph, the, uh, the pools of assets are then cut into tranches, uh, and that customizes both the cash flow payments and the risk. Uh, and these rely on mathematical models to, to price this risk, uh, and those models were built on limited historical data. Uh, and they were also modeling human behavior, which is not the same as, uh, as modeling physics. Um, this graph here uh, shows it, it, at the top is, is RMBS, that stands for Residential Mortgage-Backed Securities. There were also Commercial Mortgage-Backed Securities called CMBS. Um, and the tranches, as you can see, the senior tranches, the mezzanine tranches, and then the lower tranches, uh, they were standardized according to guidelines that were set up by the credit rating agencies. Uh, next slide, please. So the lower tranches um, of the mortgage-backed securities were then uh, hived off uh, to create collateralized debt obligations. And the collateralized debt obligation market um, uh, grew very quickly. And uh, even though the collateralized debt obligations were created from the higher risk portions of the mortgage-backed securities, uh, the collateralized debt obligations themselves were also rated uh, you know, as investment grade, as high quality uh, by the rating agencies. Not only were collateralized debt obligations given, given investment grade ratings, but then later on you had collateralized debt obligations created from other CDOs and then synthetic CDOs that didn't really represent any real assets but was just a, a bet on the mortgage market. So you can see here from uh, that, that lots and lots of money went into this. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. And in spite of the fact that, that this really grew, um, so just uh, from the uh, Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report, you can see that Moody's, um, from 2002 to 2006, their volume of residential mortgage-backed securities doubled. They went, and their, um, their revenue went from 62 to 169 million, and their staff doubled. However, um, in the same period, uh, their, their collateralized debt obligation uh, work went up by seven times, but their staff dedicated to that only went up by 24 percent. Uh, and in the period from 2003 to 2006, the revenue from their uh, CDO work uh, went from $12 million to $91 million. So uh, there were not adequate uh, resources invested along with the, uh, to, to accompany the rise in the, in the revenues that came from that. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So at the end of the day, um, the collateralized debt obligations, you know, all of the mortgage-backed securities had some impairment, meaning they, some, some or all uh, weren't paid on time. Uh, the collateralized debt obligations, as you can see, were a higher uh, higher percentage of that. Uh, but it's a lot of money, and if you add that up, it looks like it's $2 billion about. Um, and some of the things that, uh, that, have, that have come out about this, the process of the credit rating agencies was that there were internal cultures uh, at the big three agencies to maximize revenue and maximize market share. Uh, there was pressure from the underwriters, uh, and the underwriters were also the issuers in this case, uh, because the credit rating agencies had traditionally been rating um, the repayment risk of corporations. But for a, a mortgage-backed security issuance facility or CDO, uh, that entity 
which is the issuer of the securities, is actually created by the banks. And, and the fact that the banks could do this and get these securities, get the, these assets off their balance sheet was part of what was driving it. So there's one interesting quote uh, from the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, an, uh, an interview that said, uh, instead of being an independent arbiter of risk, uh, we became a captive facilitator of risk transfer. Um, so the ratings quality, there should have been, in theory, there was going to be competition around who could provide the highest quality ratings. But that's not what happened. What happened was that was trumped by a race to the bottom. The lowest credit enhancement needed for the highest rating is what was winning out. And so if the credit rating agencies weren't giving a rating, um, then the underwriters and the issuers would just take their business elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please. Could we have uh, one more slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so in 2006, uh, Moody's gave AAA ratings to over 30 mortgage to an average of over 30 mortgage securities each business day, uh, and the subprime the delinquency rate in subprime loans um, had already had increased by January of 2007, um, as you can see there. And Moody's and S&P continued to issue AAA ratings, uh, and then. They issued a bunch in July. Uh, until July 10th, they started uh, downgrading. And this exacerbated the financial crisis because uh, there were hedge funds that were highly leveraged, um, and they were subject to margin calls because they were using these mortgage backed securities and CDOs as collateral for loans to purchase more securities. And once the quality of that collateral uh, went down with the downgrades, they had to pony up more cash, and that is what resulted in freezing up the market. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll let you read this yourselves, but I just wanted to, you know, to go over some of the, the findings uh, that uh, Senator Levin's committee came out with last week. Uh, and actually, they had a hearing in April of last year where they found these same things. So the uh, the, the involvement of the rating agencies in the crisis involved inaccurate rating models, um, competitive pressure, the failure to reevaluate their rating um, methodology when in the face of uh, in, in, in the face of evidence that the ratings weren't working as early as 2007, um, the failure to factor in fraud, laxity, or the housing bubble, inadequate resources, um, mass downgrades, failed ratings. Uh, the statutory bar of the SEC, and legal pressure from uh, all of their uh, customers for AAA ratings. Uh, the la my last slide is just a list of resources for folks who want to do, uh, who would like to read some of the uh, primary research on, on this. So that's my presentation. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I actually have a quick question for you. I, I know you have a lot of contacts with um, a lot of the big NRSROs. Do you know whether the agencies have undertaken any changes on their own initiative in response to what happened in the crisis? I think that there has been a lot of turnover, but, um, for example, the, the head person at Moody's is still there, and he uh, does not get painted in a very favorable way in the FCIC report. Uh, I know that uh, Dodd Frank required that the agencies change the way they rate municipal bonds, and they have published new new reports. Uh, but I, I don't really think that uh, that fundamentally the culture has changed. And I, I have to say, I was uh, I was meeting with a an investment manager last week, and they told me that they didn't like the way one agency, one NRSRO was uh, approaching a particular asset class and that they intended to go to the other two. Uh, so that game certainly does not seem to have changed. Thank you, Lisa. Sean, do we have you on now? Uh, yes, you do. Uh, 
Terrific, Sean. Then what I'd like to do is, is go back to Sean Egan now. Again, Sean is the uh, president and founding principal of Egan Jones, and he's able to give us some inside perspective from within an NRSRO. And, and Sean, you're going to talk to us a little bit today about the structure of the industry and the way credit ratings work. I'd be happy to. Um, the uh, slide that I'd like to start with is on page four. Now, I don't have access uh, to it, so I'll just uh, name the pages as I, I uh, step through this. Uh, right there. Okay. Uh, the, the rating firms have been uh, in existence for quite some time. In fact, uh, the uh, first uh, rating firm that is uh, currently in the market has uh, was formed over 100 years ago. And the reason why is because there's a natural need for uh, third parties to assess credit quality. Certainly, the buyers of securities uh, can do some themselves, but it's uh, not the best allocation of resources if you have one transaction and you might have as many as uh, five or 600 uh, potential buyers for each and every one of them to do uh, credit analysis. A better starting point might be an independent agent uh, to uh, do, uh, do that assessment. And in fact, that's how the industry got started a number of years ago, actually analyzing railroad bonds. Um, and the industry uh, grew over time to the point where uh, in the, the early 70s, there was a switch in the business model. And we can, I can explain that a little bit later. Um, the uh, rating plot, let me first also um, uh, explain what an NRSRO is, and I'm on to page uh, five. An NRSRO is the acronym for, um, and it was derived by the, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, for Nationally Recognized Statistical Rating Organization. Um, basically, it's the designation that the SEC has used to recognize uh, firms that meet the criteria for uh, a rating firm. And the process is uh, done in a, for recognizing rating firms, is done via the no action process where uh, the SEC will uh, allow uh, users of credit ratings uh, to uh, originally use them for uh, capital purposes as the broker dealers uh, they had to uh, use ratings so they could properly assess their capital levels. Obviously, it's grown, uh, it's grown far beyond the uh, uh, was it the broker dealers to the point where uh, now, if the SEC were to strip away any reference to rating firms, uh, that the business would continue. It uh, doesn't need any sort of support from the the SEC uh, directly or indirectly. The, uh, as a result of the uh, NRS road designation, each of the firms uh, is examined by the SEC on an annual basis. A team comes in and examines all of their, their processes to make sure that they're complying with uh, what the SEC views to be uh, appropriate ways of conducting business. Basically, you have to keep track of revenues. You have to uh, maintain uh, records for how ratings are assessed and other items like that. Uh, the area that the SEC does not get into is uh, the actual ratings themselves, and you could argue that is the essence, and uh, that would be a valid argument, but they've uh, purposely steered clear of the ratings themselves. Let me uh, just address the rating process. Uh, the rating process starts with a request for a rating or a request to update a rating, and that might come from a, an issuer in the case of uh, S&P, Moody's, and Fitch, who are primarily compensated by the, the issuers, or it might uh, come from an investor. It can come from right, might come from the rating firm itself when they see that there's some news in, uh, in the marketplace and want to respond to it. The second step is review of the issuer updating it, and it might be the issuer itself or it might be the uh, different securities that the issuer is um, uh, has outstanding or, or plans on, on issuing in the near future. The next step is the suggestion of the rating, um, and, the, and after that, it's approved by the, uh, the the rating committee, and then there's an issuance and an ongoing monitoring uh, process. 
Um, I'm on to uh, chart seven. Now, this was uh, uh, this chart was put together by the uh, UFCW. I think it uh, explains the process or uh, the players very well. And that is that uh, on the right hand side, you have the issuer slash company. Uh, in the middle, you have the debt. To the left, on the upper side, um, upper left hand side, you have the ratings, and down below it, you have the the banks, the, the investment banks, and the purchasers are on the lower right hand side. The core issue is really the linkage uh, between uh, the banks that uh, get to decide which rating firm to uh, use um, and uh, the rating firm itself. Uh, the, there's a, a number of, there's been three major investigations into the rating industry, and they all have touched on that, that fundamental uh, problem of getting paid by the uh, investment banker slash issuer. Uh, in fact, I'm on to page eight, uh, if you will. This is uh, the uh, Center 11's uh, uh, report that was just issued, I think, about 10 days ago or so. And uh, the comment is, the conflict of interest inherent in an issuer pay setup is clear. Rating agencies are incentivized to offer the highest rating as opposed to offering the most accurate rating. That would, um, I think as mentioned, the race to the bottom is, uh, is an issue. and it has been an issue and remains an issue. On to page 9, which is the last slide, um, I believe, yes, uh, that is, again, the, uh, the Levin uh, Commission, which echoes the findings of, um, of uh, the Angelides Commission and also, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, the, the SEC. And that is, the issuers and investment banks engage in rating shopping, choosing the rating agency that offers the highest rating. Thank you for that, Sean. I, I actually have a question for you. Um, one of the problems with ratings that has repeatedly been raised by commentators, at least, is that ratings are not used consistently across different classes of securities. And so, uh, for example, a, a AAA rating, say for a CDO, may not indicate the same degree of creditworthiness uh, as a AAA rating for a bond. Um, do you see this as a concern? And, and, and what do you think about uh, proposals that are out now to try to create a universal system aimed at ensuring that, that ratings are used consistently? I think to a large extent that's rewriting history. There's no disclosure of that uh, as of um, eight years ago or so. And the way we run our business, and by the way, we, we uh, are not paid by issuers, but the way we run our business is that a rating in one category uh, is equivalent to a rating in another category. It should be an indication of the probability of default. Uh, some investors want the additional information of loss given default, but a rating on its own should just indicate the probability of default, and it, it should be uh, it, it should be the same probability that is geared to whether you're talking about corporates, municipals, or structured finance, or even sovereigns. So um, there is. Uh, uh, I don't know to what extent uh, that's going to be addressed over the next couple of years, but there should certainly be some consistency because quite often investors skip between categories and it makes it much more difficult for those investors to make decisions. Furthermore, it's not fair to announce that uh, the structure finance or the natural uh, is uh, that the, the, the bands are much uh, significantly different than they are in other categories. Thank you for that, Sean. And now, Jeff Mahoney from CII is going to address some of the current legislative and regulatory efforts to reform the credit rating agency. Jeff? Thank you, Michael. Uh, appreciate the invitation to participate in this program. Back in February 2009, the Council of Institutional Investors, together with the CFA Institute, formed an investors working group. Uh, the purpose of the so-called IWT was to provide an investor perspective on ways to improve the regulation of the U.S. financial markets in light of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. The IWT was chaired by William H. Donaldson and Arthur Levitt, Jr., both former chairs of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, included a nonpartisan panel of 16 prominent public policy experts, including Barbara Roper, who we will be hearing from in a few minutes. The IWT issued a final report in July 2009 that discussed 10 areas in which they developed findings and recommendations which they believed provided an appropriate plan of action for Congress and the administration to restore trust, stability, and vibrancy to the U.S. financial markets. Following the issuance of the final report, 
The board membership of the Council of Institutional Investors formally endorsed the IWT findings and recommendations and advocated those recommendations and continue to advocate those recommendations before Congress and the administration. One of the ten areas the IWT addressed in their final report related to nationally recognized statistical grading organizations, or NRS or OAS. The IWT identified four issues with NRS or OAS which they believed needed to be addressed as part of the financial reform effort. Conflicts of interest, lax regulatory oversight, over-reliance on ratings, and limited liability. Let me just briefly walk through each of these four problem areas, highlight the IWT's findings and recommendations, and then briefly describe those provisions of Dodd-Frank that address, at least in part, the IWT's recommendations. So we start with problem number one, conflicts of interest. Next slide, please. The IWT concluded that the issuer pay model for credit rating agencies clearly created conflicts of interest which contributed to the poor quality of credit ratings. Acknowledging that the issuer pay model is likely to continue to remain in effect for some time, the IWT provided three specific recommendations intended to minimize NRSRO conflicts going forward. First, the IWT concluded that as an immediate step, NRSRO should be required to elevate their compliance officer position to the executive level to ensure more efficient monitoring of the inherent conflicts in the issuer pay model. Second, the IWT recommended that NRSROs be required to provide more complete and prominent disclosures of potential conflicts of interest as they arise. And finally, as a potential longer-term solution to addressing the conflict of interest problem, the IWT recommended that a new compensation system for NRSROs be developed that would require that the fees earned by credit rating agencies be deferred and paid over a period of time, with the total amount of the payment being dependent upon the performance of the original ratings and changes to those ratings relative to the credit performance of the rated instruments. The conflict of interest problem identified by the IWT, like many other problems linked to the financial crisis, was largely addressed in Dodd-Frank through, requi through required studies. In fact, with respect to conflicts of interest in credit rating agencies, there are at least three relevant studies in Dodd-Frank. First, Section 939D requires the Governmental Account Accountability Office to conduct a study on alternative means of compensating credit rating agencies in recognition of their existing conflicts. Similarly, Section 939F of Dodd-Frank requires the SEC to conduct a study to examine conflicts of interest associated with the issuer pay model, in this case for the rating uh, of structured finance products. That study also requires the SEC to consider alternative means for compensating NRSROs that would create incentives for accurate credit ratings for those structured finance products. A report on this study is required to be completed in July of next year. The TAO study I mentioned earlier is uh, required to be completed in July of uh, this year. Uh, importantly, following the issuance of the SEC report to Congress, Doc Frank requires the SEC to establish some system for assigning NRSROs to determine the initial credit ratings of structured finance products in a manner that prevents the product's issuer, sponsor, or underwriter from selecting the NRSRO that determines the rating. And finally, uh, Section 939C of Dodd-Frank requires the SEC to conduct another study on NRSRO independence in that study, the SEC is required to examine the management of conflicts of interest raised by an NRSRO that provides other services, including risk management advisory services and consulting services. A report on that study is required to be submitted to Congress in July of 2013 with recommendations from the SEC on how to improve the integrity of ratings issued by the NRSROs. As indicated, none of these studies have yet been completed. In addition to the studies, Dodd-Frank does include provisions addressing the compliance officer issue that the IWT uh, raised in their recommendations. The, those provisions uh, in Section 932 of Dodd-Frank, while not elevating the compliance officer to the executive level as recommended by the IWT, they do attempt to ensure that the compliance officers are more effective in preventing and reporting conflicts of interest by prohibiting uh, certain activities by the compliance officer, and also by requ requiring the compliance officer uh, to provide a report to the SEC on their findings. 
Let me move now to problem number two on my next slide, please. Lacks regulatory oversight. Uh, the IWG found that despite the semi-official status of NRS arose as financial gatekeepers, uh, the rating agencies face minimal scrutiny from federal regulators. The IWG noted that the Credit Rating Agency Reform Act of 2006, while providing a standardized process for NRS arose registration, provided the SEC with limited oversight powers and that such limited oversight was untenable given the central role that rating agencies played in the financial crisis. The IWG explicitly recommended that SEC authority over NRS roles be significantly expanded and strengthened, particularly with respect to regulation of credit rating agency practices and disclosures. Section 932 of Dodd-Frank includes a number of provisions intended to enhance SEC oversight of NRS roles. Perhaps the most significant of those provisions is one that would create an independent office of credit ratings within the SEC. The stated purpose of that office is to protect investors, to promote accuracy in credit ratings, and to prevent conflicts of interest from unduly influencing credit ratings going forward. Importantly, the SEC would make public an annual report that's required to be created by that office summarizing the essential findings of their annual examinations of the NRS arose. The SEC has publicly announced that it has deferred establishing the Office of Credit Ratings because of budgetary issues and has not yet identified a timeline for when this important office will be established and operational. Section 932 of Dodd-Frank also enhances the SEC's authority over NRS arose in a number of other important ways, including providing the SEC the authority to discipline, fine, and deregister a credit rating agency, the authority to deregister rating agencies for issuing poor ratings, the authority to issue rules requiring NRSROs to publicly disclose performance information on their initial ratings and any subsequent changes to those ratings. Let me now move to problem number three, identified by the IWG, over-reliance on NRSRO ratings. The IWG was quite critical of investors for relying too heavily on NRSRO ratings and making investment decisions. They concluded that the over-reliance on NRSRO ratings by investors was aided by the many references to NRSRO ratings embedded in laws and regulations. While acknowledging that it was not practical to abolish those references overnight, the IWT recommended they be removed gradually over time. Section 939 of the Dodd-Frank Act eliminates federal statutory references to credit rating agencies in a number of specific statutes including a certain provisions of the Investment Company Act and Exchange Act. In addition, 939A of Dodd-Frank requires each federal agency to review its regulations that reference credit ratings. The agencies are required to remove any references and substitute a standard of creditworthiness that it deems appropriate in the circumstances. Both of these provisions I just discussed take effect July 2012. Uh, to date, the SEC has issued two proposals for public comment to begin implementing these new requirements, neither of which has yet been finalized. And now let me move to problem four, limited liability. The IWT found that the limited civil liability that NRSROs have long enjoyed was a contributing factor to those agencies' poor performance and lack of diligence in the rating process. More specifically, the IWT recommended that Congress eliminate Securities Act Rule 436G, which is a special provision that exempts NRS arose from liability under Section 11 of the Securities Act for material misstatements or omissions of fact and registration statements. Section 933 of the Dodd-Frank includes uh, two provisions, uh, uh, two additional provisions intended to facilitate private rights of action against credit rating agencies. The first provision establishes that the enforcement and penalty provisions of the Exchange Act apply to statements made by credit rating agencies in the same manner and to the same extent that they apply to statements made by registered public accounting firms or security analysts. The second provision modifies the requisite state of mind requirements for private securities fraud actions, potentially making it easier for plaintiffs to survive the motion to dismiss uh, stage of securities fraud litigation when credit rating agencies are defendants in those actions. Uh, both of those provisions became effective uh, following the enactment of Dodd-Frank, although their effectiveness uh, in increasing the accountability of credit rating agencies uh, remains unclear. 
Finally, Section 939 of Dodd-Frank uh, ultimately adopted the IWT's recommendation I mentioned earlier regarding eliminating NRS Arose exemption from Section 11 liability, and that provision became effective uh, one day after the enactment of Dodd-Frank. Unfortunately, to date, the intent of this important provision has been thwarted by the actions of the three largest NRS Arose with some assistance from the SEC staff. And this issue provides me the perfect segue to turn the program back to Michael, who's going to provide you with some more detail over the current controversy surrounding the Section 11 liability and NRS Arose. Michael? Thank you, Jeff. And before I reach the specific issue of the uh, repeal of 436G, um, we have a, a question from our audience. Uh, Jeff, one of our audience members is asking, uh, whether or not the SEC actually has the staff necessary to get the many studies on its plate done. Um, do you have any feel for that? Well, based on the statements that Chairman Shapiro and other commissioners have made, it could be very difficult to get those studies uh, completed uh, without additional funding. Uh, they were provided, uh, their funding was not cut as some had advocated with respect to fiscal 2011. So now the big issue is going to be their level of funding uh, for 2012. Uh, if that funding does not get increased uh, from fiscal 2011, I think there's a question as to whether or not they're going to be able to complete uh, these studies, at least uh, uh, in the time frame given in, Dodd in the Dodd-Frank Act. And another and perhaps related question, Jeff, I, I know that there is still a great deal of rulemaking to be done pursuant to Dodd-Frank that in the end will be crucial in determining whether many of the reforms in Dodd-Frank will work. And how much opportunity is there for institutional investors or for shareholder advocates to play a role in that rulemaking process? Well, the SEC has a notice and comment period for all of these rules, uh, so I think it's uh, important uh, that all who are interested in this issue uh, provide comments to the SEC when these uh, uh, when these proposals are put out uh, for comment. Uh, it's going to be very important that investors make their voice heard throughout this process in order to get the changes that, that, that we need in this area. Thank you, Jeff. And, and now I, I will turn to the very thorny issue of uh, the attempt in Dodd-Frank to increase liability for the credit rating agencies under the federal securities laws. Um, and I suppose that uh, this is really uh, one of the ironic, unintended consequences of regulatory reliance on NRSRO credit ratings, uh, and that is that that reliance really gave the power uh, to credit rating agencies, in some respects, to resist regulation. And the case in point here concerns the Dodd-Frank Act's provisions that would subject NRSROs to the same standard of care in issuing ratings that accountants and other experts are already subject to under the federal securities laws. And the story really starts out with something called Regulation AB, which is issued under the Securities Act of 1933. Regulation AB requires the disclosure of NRSRO credit ratings for asset-backed securities offerings. Practically, this means that for an asset-backed security to be offered, the rating agency involved in rating the security would have to give its consent uh, for the disclosure of its opinion together uh, with the offering circular. And the goal of Regulation AB was a good one at the time. It was to increase the information available to purchasers of these securities. Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but ultimately would come back to undermine, I think, in, in some ways, a key reform measure in Dodd-Frank. And of course, what I'm getting at is, is one of the important achievements in Dodd-Frank, which Jeff mentioned, and that was the repeal of Section 436G of the Securities Act of 1933. Um, 436G was the provision that had effectively immunized uh, the NRSROs from liability under Section 11 of the Securities Act, um, even if the opinions they gave in connection with offerings were materially misleading. By repealing this provision in uh, using Dodd-Frank, Congress was ensuring that NRSROs would be held to a higher standard of care in issuing ratings. The rating agencies themselves, however, had something of an ace up their sleeves. Uh, they could avoid the new standard and avoid potential exposure to liability simply by refusing to agree for their ratings opinion to be disclosed to the public in offering circulars. 
which of course would leave uh, would be offerors of asset backed securities unable to comply with regulation AB and uh, effectively bringing the entire asset backed securities industry to a halt. And of course that's precisely what happened after Dodd Frank passed. Rather than face new standards of liability under Dodd Frank, NRSROs simply refused to consent to the disclosure of ratings that they offered uh, for asset backed securities. And this really panicked. Uh, would-be securities off, uh, issuers like Ford Credit Motor Co., which uh, actually wrote a letter to the SEC almost immediately asking for assistance, saying that uh, it wanted to make an offering and could not because it was unable to get the consent of the NRSRO who had rated uh, the security that it was wanting to offer. Um, in response to Ford's letter, the SEC issued its first no-action letter on July 22nd assuring the NRSROs that it would take no action to enforce the new Dodd-Frank liability standard for at least six months. And this no action period was extended indefinitely in a second letter issued on November 22nd, in which the SEC stated that the additional time was necessary uh, for the Commission to determine whether the repeal of 436G might, quote, affect the Commission's disclosure requirements regarding credit ratings for asset-backed securities offerings. In its November letter, I think the SEC was alluding to the fact that under Dodd-Frank, the SEC would be working to remove references to NRSRO ratings from its rules. And once NRSROs were written out of Regulation AB, uh, theoretically, the agencies would no longer need to give their consent for the disclosure of ratings to the public, which would circumvent liability under uh, Section 11. In the meantime, of course, until that happens, the SEC has basically been too scared to implement the new liability standard for fear that NRSROs would again bring the asset-backed security market, which is only just uh, resurgent, to a halt. And uh, interestingly, Egan Jones has just announced uh, at the end of last week that it would voluntarily subject itself to the new standard and still offer ratings for asset-backed securities. I think it is the only NRSRO to do so, at least up to now. And um, I think that certainly makes it more difficult for the SEC to justify holding off implementation of Dodd-Frank because at least one NRSRO is willing to offer the ratings necessary for asset-backed securities offerings to go forward. If there's a moral in this story, I think it's that when Congress put NRSROs in regulations, it actually gave enormous power to the agencies, uh, enough power sometimes even to resist attempts at regulation. Uh, finally, we're going to turn to Barbara Roper of CFA to consider some of the complicated issues surrounding the ongoing effort to reduce dependence on ratings. Barbara? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, so, as the earlier presentations have made clear, Congress, in adopting this legislation, took a sort of Chinese menu approach to reforming the credit rating agencies and, you know, sort of a little bit of uh, increased independence, a little bit of increased regulatory oversight, quite a bit more increased transparency around ratings and um, theoretically at least a lot less reliance on uh, credit rating agencies in our regulations. Um, on the surface, at least, that, that proposal to reduce our system's reliance on credit rating agencies makes a lot of sense. Um, as Lisa Lindsley uh, described, the credit rating agencies were key enablers of the financial crisis. Surely any credible reform package needs to take them out of their central role as the market's sort of quasi-official or official arbiters of risk. And the problem that uh, we found as, as the regulators have then attempted to implement that directive is that it's a lot easier said than done. The first couple of slides that I have here um, simply uh, walk through how, how the credit rating agencies achieved their sort of central dominant role in our financial markets. Um, I'm not going to go into that in detail. Sean already covered some of it. Um, there are just a couple of points from uh, those slides that I'd like to highlight. One, as Sean indicated, credit rating agencies started out as investor-paid information providers. 
They serve the beneficial market function by compiling information on credit risks that their subscribers would have found it difficult or costly to compile on their own. However, you know, they, they started to take on a more uh, official role in the markets after the 29 stock market crash. In the 1970s, at precisely the point where they really began to see a formal, play a formalized role in the financial system, um, they also changed their business model. The big, the big rating firms did to one that was issuer paid, a business model that ratchets up conflicts of interest that are, quite frankly, inconsistent with the gatekeeper role that the credit rating agencies were increasingly playing. And throughout this period, there were you know, repeated warnings that ratings might not be as reliable as our regulations seem to assume, even when it comes to the relatively straightforward task of assessing credit risks of corporate and government bonds um, of, say, Enron or WorldCom or Orange County or Pacific Gas and Electric or Washington Public Power Supply Company, all of a system, all of which um, had major credit breaks that the, the that the big credit rating agencies failed to predict or provide any warning of. So, building a whole regulatory structure that assumes that credit rating agencies were capable of accurately rating the complex structured finance products the mortgage-backed securities, the CDOs, seems foolhardy in retrospect. Um, it was not, however, until um, we found ourselves in the midst of the financial crisis that the full extent of the systemic risk um, that had resulted from our regulations' undue reliance on credit ratings was revealed. Um, so as you know, as I say, as Jeff previously described, Dodd Frank took a multifaceted approach to um, credit agent rating agency reforms. I'm going to be focusing on the 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 reducing the proposals to reduce regulatory reliance on ratings. So there's a two part approach to reducing reliance on ratings in Dodd Frank. One, you know, it it, it takes out of the statutory language the rep of the financial regulation relation of the financial laws all of the references to credit ratings um, and in typically when it takes it out it replaces it with a, a reference to alternative standards of credit worthiness that it anticipated that the regulators would establish um, Sorry, my slides just got out of order. But um, and then, in addition to doing that, it uh, it requires the federal agencies within a year after a, uh, of enactment to go through all of their regulations, identify any place in those regulations that identify references to. Uh, credit uh, measurements and uh, um, to modify the regulations that they've identified by that review to remove any reference to ratings or any requirement of reliance on ratings and to substitute a standard of credit worthiness that the agency determines is appropriate. Um, So the, the way that's written, the, the legislation anticipates that the regulators will, in fact, develop alternative measures of credit worthiness that would, would substitute for the, the ratings themselves. Um, this is not optional. Even if the regulators find that they're not able to develop appropriate alternatives, they're still required to remove the references to ratings. And that has been a source of grave concern among the regulators. Um, recently, for example, SEC Commissioner Luis Aguilar said, quote, the commission has not been able to find or develop an acceptable substitute. 
the key question, he said, is what do regulators do when no appropriate substitute exists? FDIC Chairman Sheila Baer, former Comptroller John Dugan, and Federal Reserve Governor Daniel Cerullo have all raised similar concerns. And in Senate testimony last September, Acting Comptroller John Walsh called for Section 939A to be amended to give regulators more flexibility. Nonetheless, the, the process of coming into compliance with this provision of Dodd, uh, Frank, continues to go forward. And the SEC has issued two proposed rules that eliminate references to rail ratings, one in the rules governing asset-backed securities and one in rules governing money market mutual funds. And the federal banking regulators have issued a joint advance notice of proposed ruling seeking suggestions for alternative measures of credit worthiness to be used in risk-based capital standards. So the, the proposed changes to Regulation AB have actually been um, pretty well received. Uh, under the current standard, in order to qualify for sale through what's called the shelf registration process, which allows the sale of securities with less red tape than the traditional process, asset-backed securities need investment-grade ratings. The proposed changes to Regulation AB do not actually create an alternative measure of creditworthiness. Instead, the SEC has proposed both to significantly change the self-registration process for asset-backed securities to require more timely and more complete disclosures and to impose other regulatory requirements in place of um, credit ratings to qualify. And so, for example, there's a risk retention or skin in the game uh, requirement to qualify for shelf registration. They have to, the issuer or the sponsor has to hold 5% of each tranche of the, the asset-backed security. Um, the CEO has to certify that the assets in the pool have the characteristics that provide a reasonable basis to believe that they will produce cash flows to service payments on the securities as described in the prospectus. And you know, they also are subject to uh, periodic reporting requirements under the Exchange Act, which they had previously been exempted from. So the idea is not so much that they've come up with a different measure of creditworthiness in this regulation, but that they've changed the regulations to, to put in place other substantive protections that substitute for that uh, credit rating, credit worthiness rating. The money market mutual fund rules take a very different approach and, it, and have not, frankly, been as well received. Um, the, basically, for money market mutual funds, as part of how they uh, are have permission under the Investment Company Act to have, uh, you know, to maintain a one dollar value on shares, um, they have to limit themselves in order to decrease their uh, volatility. They have to limit themselves to investing in the highest um, grades of securities. So not just investment grade, but the very highest grade uh, of securities. And then beyond that, the, the fund board, the fund managers within that population of investment grade securities has an obligation to review investments to ensure that they're appropriate. What the SEC has proposed to do here is take away the limitation that they invest only in these highest rated securities and leave in place the existing requirement that the fund directors and fund managers are responsible for making their own assessment of credit worthiness. And, uh, you know, they're not entirely disinterested parties. The, the risk that has been pointed out when the SEC has put this proposal out in the past is that if you take away this limitation regarding investment, you know, investing in only the highest rated securities and don't put anything in its place uh, but the judgment of the fund directors and fund managers, 
we know from past experience that there will be some funds that will, you know, in in seeking higher returns, will test those boundaries and uh, engage in riskier conduct. And that um, there's very little likelihood, frankly, that the regulators will question those subjective judgments about credit risk until after there's some kind of, of uh, disaster that causes us to look back and recognize where we went wrong. Moreover, under this proposal, the SEC has made clear that they fully expect that fund boards and managers will remain free to consider credit ratings as part of their own assessments of credit risk. So it's not, it's not entirely clear to what extent this proposal will reduce in any meaningful way the amount of reliance that is put on credit ratings. And then finally, the, um, the banking regulators have put out this advanced uh, notice a proposed rulemaking where they're looking for suggestions on alternatives to using credit ratings in the um, risk-based capital standards. Um, they have, in doing that, identified some key principles that they'll use in assessing alternatives, including, for example, um, whether the alternative would be sufficiently transparent, rec replicable, and defined to allow various types of banking organizations to arrive at the same assessment of credit worthiness for similar exposures and to allow for appropriate supervisory review, something that I think uh, states fairly clearly what the challenge is for someone who's seeking to come up with an alternative to the ratings. And one of the particular challenges that the banking regulators face is that they have to reconcile two conflicting directives. One is to eliminate the references to ratings and reliance on ratings, and the other is to produce standards that are consistent with international standards where the Basel standards rely heavily on ratings. So one of the things that seems clear when you look at all of these proposals is that no one yet has come up with the foolproof alternative to measures of creditworthiness that Congress seemed to assume existed and were out there that Congress seemed to have in mind when it directed regulators to develop such standards. And all of these proposals, in their own way, place a premium on the ability of investors, financial institutions, regulators, to conduct their own independent assessments of credit quality when the financial regulators themselves seem to find it difficult, if not impossible, to complete this task. And all seem to anticipate that credit ratings will continue to be an important input into those independent risk assessments. So unless something fundamentally changes, it seems clear that red, credit ratings are going to continue to play an important, even central role in our fin financial markets. And I think that that has a couple of important implications. One is that it's very important that we do a good job of implementing the other provisions of Dodd-Frank designed to improve the quality and transparency of ratings. And two, that it's going to be important for investors when they're conducting their own assessments of risk to try to look at the quality of ratings, not just automatically go to the big three ratings firms, but to look at the quality of the ratings the independence of ratings, the transparency of ratings when deciding who to look to for information on credit risk. So in conclusion, you know, the market needs reliable measures of credit risk, but providing those reliable measures of credit of risk, particularly for complex structured products, is easier said than done. We don't seem to be there yet. If we're really going to wean our financial system off of its reliance on ratings and reduce its vulnerability to ratings failure, a lot more thought needs to go into how best to do that. Thank you for that, Barbara. Um, I have a, a question that can go to you and to the rest of the panel if you have any thoughts about it. And then I'd like to raise a couple of questions that we've been offered by our audience members. Um, first, my question to the panel, it, it seems as though of all the main causes of the financial crisis that have been identified, whether 
you look at the shadow banking system or executive compensation that encouraged risk or, say, lack of due diligence and loan underwriting, it's really uh, only credit ratings uh, that seem to have escaped major structural reform. And by that I mean I understand that there have been a lot of studies uh, that are called for. There's been calls for greater disclosure, more transparency. But fundamentally, the conflict of interest problems um, that Sean and Lisa both talked about uh, are still there and haven't really been addressed, at least as a regulatory matter. Um, it seems instead like the response from regulators has mostly been that investors should simply rely less on credit ratings and do a better job looking after their own risk. Um, I guess my question is a very broad one, and that is that do you think that this is an effective response to what went wrong, that ultimately it's sort of caveat emptor, and that in the end in investors uh, have to take care of themselves? Anybody? Well, I guess I would I would say um, I'm I'm concerned that we have not fundamentally solved this problem. I think Congress, in in putting together this package, uh, tried to do a lot of things, a lot of different things, um, to make ratings more transparent, so they're less of a black box, um, to make other aspects of the market more transparent so we're re less reliant on ratings to improve the governance at ratings agencies and the regulatory oversight. I think there was a political, there was a political decision made, sort of a feasibility decision made that, that Congress just didn't think it was politically realistic, that they could advance a proposal to change the business structure of the ratings agencies. Um, Congress, you know, they had just done a ratings agency reform bill a couple of years ago. There was actually a fair amount of resistance, both in the administration and in Congress itself, to doing much of anything about the ratings agencies. So the package that emerged is dramatically stronger than where Congress started. But will this solve the problem? Uh, time will tell. I, I have to say, I'm also skeptical that you solve the problem just by dealing with the business model issues. So I'm, I'm not one who's a business model purist who thinks that's the only answer to this issue, but we'll see. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel before I turn to our audience questions? This is Sean Egan of Egan Jones. Uh, two thoughts. Uh, number one, I think that the effort to reduce reliance on ratings uh, is not likely to be fruitful in the long term because you're forcing uh, industry participants to uh, duplicate work. That it, it's uh, you're better off uh, addressing it the problem head on rather than forcing 600 different investors to do uh, analysis on everything that they're they're considering. Certainly, they do have to do some some homework on the uh, securities that they purchase, but as a first cut, it saves the market a lot of time and trouble by having a reliable uh, first cut on the ratings, and uh, we haven't addressed the underlying problem with the rating firms, and that is that they have a disincentive to providing timely accurate ratings for the simple reason that the issuers want the highest rating possible, and it, it, it engenders a normal race to the bottom. In fact, if uh, there's a race to the bottom with, uh, in the words of Jim Grant, two and a half firms in the industry, uh, before that, uh, with the uh, with the additional competition uh, from issuer pay rating firms, you're going to have an even more rapid race to the bottom. Um, our view is that if there isn't the political will to uh, to break that incentive, to at least find uh, means to complement it with a uh, some parties that have the interest of the investors in mind. So at the end of the day, it's a uh, fiduciary issue, that if you're a fiduciary, it would be nice to use agents that uh, are going to protect your beneficiaries. And so um, hopefully over time that is going to, uh, you know, going to emerge. Right. I think Sean makes a really good point, um, and I would add two things. One is um, our position on the regulatory reliance issue was uh, less draconian 
than what was finally uh, included in the bill. We thought it was appropriate to, for regulators to find things to supplement reliance on ratings, to look at certain circumstances where um, there were alternative regulatory approaches, like they've done in Reg AB, to you know to have a more gradual, flexible um, regulatory response rather than just writing them out of the rules without knowing what we're putting in place. And the idea that we can suddenly um, trust banks to be making, you know, reliable, independent judgments about the credit risks of their um, holdings and uh, or money market mutual funds or any of these other parties or that, that every participant in the market is going to be able to recreate that expertise. I think that's um, a dangerous notion that we could, exactly. we could increase the risk in the system through this rather than decrease it. The major broker dealers are doing just that. Lehman Brothers is assessing uh, the the riskiness of their positions, and they had an inherent conflict in doing that. And of course, their risk was much greater than it ever should have been. Right. And then the other piece of it is, I think it puts a real responsibility to reiterate Sean's point on the investors, where we have institutional investors, you know, on those institutional investors to look at how they choose what ratings they rely on and to look for independence, to look for specialized expertise where that's appropriate, to look for a history of rating success um, so that they have, uh, so that they're getting good, reliable credit information. And if we could wrest control of this process from the issuers, that I think would be beneficial to the markets. I, I think that's right, and uh, as one of our audience members points out, a lot of public pension funds really have no choice but to rely on ratings as their own investment guidelines in fixed income are built around these ratings. Uh, and so uh, uh, ultimately they, they don't really have the opportunity for looking for other creative ways to assess risk of these connected with these complex securities other than, than looking at ratings. So I'd also like to uh, conclude with a final question that we did get from our audience, um, and I'll just read it verbatim. It seems that the regulations that have been proposed and passed so far do not address the power of the NRSROs when rating the debt of sovereigns, although this power seems immense and potentially destructive. And many are suggesting that sovereigns are held hostage by agencies and by investors. Uh, sorry. Uh, by the agencies and investors by proxy. Um, have any regulatory reforms been proposed to address uh, th that issue? That is to say, the issue of ratings with respect to sovereigns. Sean or anyone? Um, my understanding is that in, the, in Europe, there's a couple of, uh, of, of failing examples. One is Japan, probably about 10 years ago, when its rating came under pressure as a result of the whole Asia crisis. Uh, they made some attempts to clip the wings of uh, the rating firms, and ultimately they weren't very successful. The, um, in the case of Europe, there's been some proposals that the, um, uh, the, the sovereigns uh, get uh, advanced notification up to about three days or so. Um, I'm not quite sure whether that's uh, very effective in the case of the U.S. with uh, uh, Moody's, I'm sorry, S&P putting a, issuing a negative outlook. It wasn't a negative watch, which is uh, at, at a higher level, but uh, simply a negative outlook on the U.S. The U.S. Uh, received, I believe, a week uh, advance notice. Um, I, I, on the one hand, you want uh, rating firms to be able to issue the most timely and accurate ratings possible. On the other hand, you have uh, the incredible regulatory um, uh, weight of the different sovereignties uh, on the various rating firms. Uh, I think we're we're experiencing right now a behind-the-scenes um, dance of the elephants between the probably the Treasury Department, the Fed, and S and P, and and seeing what is going to happen over the next uh, next couple months. Uh, it's uh, not a problem that's easy to solve. Right, and I would add, past experience has shown that the ratings agencies themselves uh, can become sort of timid about downgrading ratings when the repercussions of those downgrading 
ratings are significant. So I think there's, in contrast to the question that the question itself, I think there's a real concern that when they're rating sovereigns or they're, um, they may be too reluctant to be as frank as they should be about what they see about the state of a particular country's debt or state of their budget. Um, Particularly for uh, politically uh, relevant entities, uh, and you see uh, that also in the corporate field in the case of GE when it, had, it couldn't even roll over its commercial paper and yet it retained the AAA rating. Um, and in the case of, uh, of the sovereign ratings, a lot of the major countries probably on a pure credit metric basis shouldn't be rated or shouldn't have been rated at the high level. Now things are, are adjusting, but the high level that they um, enjoyed over the past couple of years. Thank you both for that insight, and I'd like to thank our panel and our web audience today, and that will conclude our presentation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.